Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dreadfully Curious. The Victorian era heralded a period of extraordinary contrasts. It was an epic of bright hope, rapid urban expansion, and unprecedented female leadership, particularly marked by the formidable presence of Queen Victoria herself. Yet beneath the era's glittering achievements lurked a more sinister underbelly. It was a time while reaching for the heights of progress and refinement plunged into the depths of extreme social inequity and spawned some of the most nefarious expressions of human behavior ever. The period not only bore witness to remarkable ingenuity and creativity, but also saw these very traits twisted into ghastly forms of exploitation and inhumanity, creating a stark duality that defines the era even to this day. Just ahead, we start with some dreadfully devious poisoners who stalked and killed profit and power. Then we explore some historical figures so dreadful they remind me of Jack the Ripper. This video is intended for educational purposes, aiming to inform viewers about historical events and figures from the Victorian era. While our content is based on research and historical data in an effort to provide an accurate representation of the time, those accounts and our retelling of them may be disturbing to some viewers. Therefore, viewer discretion is advised. We have a lot of ground to cover and oh so many horrible fates to explore, so let's get started. The cobblestone streets of Bremen in the early 19th century were bustling with activity. Among the townspeople was Jesje Gottfried, a woman known for her kind demeanor and compassion. Little did they know that beneath her gentle exterior lay a dark secret. In the Gottfried household, tragedies seemed all too common. Loved ones frequently fell ill, with Jesh always by their side, nursing them with dedication until their untimely deaths. The town grieved with her, time and again, never suspecting the horrifying truth. One evening, a close friend of Gesh's was invited for dinner. As they chatted and laughed, Gesh served a hearty meal. However, as the friend was about to take his first bite, he noticed something odd, white grains sprinkled over his food, recalling rumors of arsenic's appearance. Suspicion dawned upon him. Pretending to feel unwell, he excused himself and alerted the authorities. The subsequent investigation unraveled the chilling truth. One by one, the deaths surrounding Jess were re-examined and the evidence was undeniable. The town's angel was, in fact, its grim reaper. As news of her arrest spread, the people of Bremen grappled with a mix of shock, betrayal, and horror. How could the caring woman they knew be responsible for such heinous crimes? The trial was the talk of the town, with people struggling to comprehend the magnitude of her betrayal. Over a span of 15 years, between 1813 and 1827, Gesha Gottfried poisoned and killed 15 people, including her parents, two husbands, her children, and even some of her friends. She used arsenic as her weapon of choice, earning her the moniker the Angel of Bremen, no due to her seemingly compassionate care for her victims as they suffered before their deaths. During her trial, Gesche Gottfried confessed to all of the murders, although her motives remained largely unclear. Some theories suggest she craved the attention and sympathy she received as a mourner. She was found guilty and sentenced to death. On April 21, 1831, she was publicly executed by beheading in Bremen. Gesche Gottfried's execution marked the end of her reign of terror, but her legacy lived on. The story of the Angel of Bremen became a cautionary tale a reminder of the deceptive masks that evil can wear. Gottfried's crimes and the subsequent fallout serve as a chilling reminder that appearances can be deceiving and that evil can lurk where it's least expected. In the crisp autumn air of November 1855, the Shrewsbury race course was alive with excitement. Spectators from all walks of life gathered, their eyes trained on the galloping horses and their ears tuned to the roar of the crowd. Among them were Dr. William Palmer and his friend, John Parsons Cook. Cook had reason to be optimistic that day. His horse, Polestar, was running, and he had placed a significant bet on its victory. As the race concluded and Polestar emerged triumphant, Cook's joy knew no bounds. His winnings were substantial, a fact that did not escape the notice of those around him, particularly Dr. Palmer. The two men, high on the success of the day, decided to celebrate. They dined at a local inn, reminiscing about the race and discussing future prospects. However, as the evening wore on, Cook began to feel unwell. Complaining of indigestion, he was promptly offered a pill by Palmer, who assured him it would alleviate his discomfort. 
trusting his friend, Cook swallowed the pill. But as the hours passed, his condition deteriorated rapidly. Violent convulsions racked his body, a telltale sign of strike nine poisoning. By the next morning, on November 21, 1855, John Parsons Cook was dead. Strike nine is a particularly dreadful poison, and to grasp the diabolical nature of Palmer the Poisoner, we're going to discuss greater detail. Strike nine is derived from the seeds of the Strychnose Nux Vomica tree, native to India and Southeast Asia. Historically, it was used as a pesticide, especially for killing rodents. The symptoms of strychnine poisoning can manifest quickly, often within 15 to 30 minutes of ingestion, but can sometimes take up to two hours. The first signs are usually a heightened sense of perception, unease, restlessness, and anxiety. The victim might experience twitching and stiffness in the muscles, particularly the face and neck. This is followed by painful muscle contractions, starting with the head and neck. The spasms then spread to every muscle in the body, causing the person to arch their back violently. These convulsions can be so severe that they cause muscle tears or even bone fractures. As the convulsions continue, the muscles responsible for breathing can become paralyzed. This often leads to death by asphyxiation. If the victim does not receive medical treatment, death can occur within a few hours of ingestion due to respiratory failure. Now that we understand the nature of this dreadful substance, let's get back to the story. Wing whispers began to circulate in Rugli. The sudden death of a young, healthy man, especially one who had recently come into a considerable amount of money, was suspicious. When an investigation into Cook's death was launched, all evidence pointed to one man, Dr. William Palmer. The subsequent trial in 1856 was a sensation, capturing the attention of all of England. Palmer's betrayal of his friend, driven by greed and desperation, was laid bare for all to see. The jury's verdict was unequivocal. Dr. William Palmer was guilty of murder. As he awaited his fate at the gallows in June 1856, the people of Rugley and beyond were left to reflect on the tragic events of that November evening. John Parsons Cook's victory at the races had been short-lived, overshadowed by a betrayal that cost him his life. The village of Road in Somerset was the very picture of Victorian respectability. Road Hill House, a grand residence, stood as a testament to the prosperity of the Kent family. But beneath its polished exterior lay a web of family tensions and secrets. On the fateful night of June 29, 1860, the household retired to bed expecting another peaceful night. But by morning, a horrifying discovery would shatter that peace. Little Francis Seville Kent was missing from his crib. As a frantic search ensued, ending with the grim discovery of the toddler's lifeless body in the privy, which is an outhouse toilet. This wasn't an accident or abduction, this was murder. The boy had defensive wounds on his hands, stab wounds to his chest, and his neck was cut so deeply that he was nearly decapitated. The local constabulary was baffled. How could a murderer of such barbarity have entered the securely locked house? The answer was chilling. They didn't need to. The killer was someone within the household. Enter Detective Jack, Witcher of Scotland Yard, with his sharp wit and keener instincts. The house was a maze of hidden resentments, and Witcher believed he had found the thread leading to the heart of the maze. Constance Kent, the elder half-sister, but proving it was another matter entirely. The case became a sensation, splitting public opinion. Some saw Constance as a victim of ruthless police tactics, while others believed she was a cold-blooded killer. The grand halls of Road Hill House echoed with whispered accusations and hushed conversations. Five years of silence passed until the walls of Road Hill House gave up their final secret. Constance Kent, burdened by guilt, confessed to the crime. The mystery that had gripped the nation was finally laid to rest, but the shadow of the Road Hill House murder would long linger, a dark reminder of the secrets that can lurk behind even the most respectable. While Constance was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, she was able to secure her release in 1885 due to good behavior. Smutty Nose Island is one of the Isles of Shoals a group of small islands located off the coast of New Hampshire and Maine. In the late 19th century, these islands were home to a tight-knit community of fishermen and their families. 
the Isles of Shoals with their rugged beauty, were a peaceful refuge for the fishermen and their families who called them home. But that night would forever shatter that tranquility. On the night of March 6, 1873, two women, Karen Christensen and Anethi Christensen, were brutally murdered on Spuddy Nose Island. The sole survivor of the attack was Marina Hontvet, who managed to hide from the assailant and later identified him. Marin Hantvet, a Norwegian immigrant, had settled on Smutty Nose Island with her husband John and her sister Karen Christensen. They lived a quiet life with the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean as their backdrop. John, away due to work, wasn't home. That left Dene and the other two women at the house alone. That night, as winter's last snow lay on the ground and spring seemed still just a bit beyond the horizon, someone entered the house while the women slept. It was Louis Wagner, a man they would have recognized because he had worked for John and was known around the island. They also often helped Wagner in various ways with food or clothes and would have considered him a friend. But his intentions were far from friendly on this night. Wagner attacked the inhabitants of the house, aiming to rob them of their savings. While he didn't perhaps initially intend to kill them, Accounts indicate that he lashed out from the darkness without hesitation when the dog barked and Karen awoke, mistaking Wagner's dark figure and silhouette at first for John's. Struck first with a weapon of convenience, a chair. He smashed Karen again then again, then again hitting both Karen and Marin this time. Somehow the sisters were able to close the bedroom door, separating themselves from their attacker. They barricaded the bedroom door while he fumbled to get in around this time, and he escaped the house via a window but found herself barefoot in the snow, on an island containing just the victims and their killer. Wagner, pausing his effort to break into the bedroom, caught up with her outside near a woodpile. He grabbed the axe and struck, killing Anethe. He then turned and headed back towards the house to finish the assault he'd began against Karen and Moran. Moraine, witnessing this dreadful butcher's terrible axe through the window and sensing how hopeless the situation had become. Moran had a choice, stay and die with her sister or run and maybe just maybe survive. She chose to run. As Wagner entered the house, Marin climbed through the bedroom window into the bloodied snow with Ringy. While it was no doubt tempting to run to another nearby building for shelter and help, Marin had the wits to anticipate that Wagner wasn't finished and that he would find her and kill her if she let him. Instead, she ran along the shore of the far side of the island. As she gave the cottage she had just escaped as much distance as she could, she heard the terrified cries of Karen, cold shivering and clutching the dog close. She crawled between two rocks near the water's edge, where the pounding waves drowned out Karen's cries, along with all other sound. At the house, Karen, dazed and bloodied, was trying to escape through a window when Wagner burst into the bedroom. He swung the axe wildly at Karen and hit the mark. He then swung at her again, this time missing and splitting the sill, and also breaking the handle of the axe. It didn't matter though. Life was leaving Karen's body and her figure melted away from the window into the dark room. Wagner used a handkerchief as a ligature, tightening it until he was sure she was dead. He then hunted Marin, circling every building on the island, leaving bloody footprints in the snow as he searched desperately for the only living witness to his despicable acts, searching for the sole survivor on an island otherwise now populated only by the dead. Around 8 a.m. the next morning, Marin left her hiding place. Wagner had fled earlier, wanting the cover of darkness to aid his escape. Marin, on frozen feet, staggered across the breakwater connecting Smutty Nose and Malaga. On a violent rampage, both Karen and Anne had been brutally murdered. Marin, using her wits, managed to hide from Wagner and physically survived the night, but the traumatic horrors she experienced were beyond words. As dawn broke, Marin, traumatized and in shock, made her way for help. The peaceful community was horrified by the brutality of the crime. The manhunt for Wagner began, and he was soon captured in Boston. Marin's harrowing testimony sealed Wagner's fate, and he was sentenced to hang. The Smutty Nose Island murders, with their mix of betrayal, brutality, and tragedy, became a dark chapter in the history of the Isles of Shoals, forever changing the way the inhabitants viewed their idyllic home. The trial of Louis Wagner commenced on June 9, 1873. After nine days of testimony and 55 minutes of deliberation, he was found guilty as charged. In a twist, he broke out of jail within a week, but was recaptured in New Hampshire. 
on June 25, 1875, 27 months after the crime. Wagner was led into the yard of the state prison in Thomaston, Maine, and hanged. The Smutty Nose Island murders remain a haunting tale of betrayal and violence in an otherwise peaceful setting. The tragedy serves as a reminder that even in the most remote and serene locations where man goes, so too shall evil find its way. Born in 1849 in Killeen County, Wexford, Ireland, Kate Webster had a history of criminal activities including theft and deception before she moved to England. In England, she took up various jobs, often as a domestic servant, but her criminal tendencies persisted. In 1879, Kate was employed by Julia Martha Thomas, a widow in her 50s as a maid. Their relationship was tumultuous with frequent arguments. On March 2, 1879, following a particularly heated altercation, Kate violently attacked and murdered Mrs. Thomas. In an attempt to cover up her crime, Kate dismembered the body and disposed of the remains in various locations. Some parts were thrown into the River Thames while others were buried. Here's how that went. On a cool evening in late March 1879, a package washed ashore on the banks of the River Thames near Barnes Bridge. A local coal man, attracted by the mysterious bundle, made a grisly discovery. The police were alerted and the investigation began. The remains were identified as belonging to Julia Martha Thomas, a widow from Richmond who had been missing for several weeks. But how did parts of her end up in the Thames? The last person to see Mrs. Thomas alive was her maid, Kate Webster. As investigators dug deeper, they uncovered a tale of deceit, violence, and treachery. Neighbors reported hearing loud arguments between the two women. Kate, trying to maintain the facade of normalcy, told inquirers that Mrs. Thomas had traveled to Ireland, but her story was riddled with inconsistencies. The final piece of the puzzle fell into place when a young boy playing near Webster's rented accommodations found a box containing a large pot and a sharp knife, both stained with blood. The pot had been used by Kate to boil parts of her victim's body in a macabre attempt to dispose of the evidence. The discovery sent shockwaves through Victorian London. The gruesome nature of the crime, combined with the audacity of Kate's actions in its aftermath, both fascinated and horrified the public. Newspapers were filled with lurid details, and the case became the talk of the town. As the trial progressed, Kate's dark past came to light, painting a picture of a woman who would stop at nothing to further her own interests. Kate was no stranger to the law from a young age, she was reportedly involved in theft and other minor crimes during her youth. To evade the law and deceive her employers, Kate often used various aliases. This not only helped her secure jobs despite her criminal history, but also made it difficult for authorities to track her. For the murder of Julia Martha Thomas, Kate had been convicted of theft on multiple occasions. Her modus operandi typically involved stealing from her employers or from homes where she worked as a domestic servant. To further hide her crime, Kate posed as Mrs. Thomas for several days, selling the victim's belongings and even attempting to rent out her house. Suspicion arose when she tried to sell some of the stolen property. Her erratic behavior and the sudden disappearance of Mrs. Thomas raised alarm. It fled to Ireland, but the police were soon on her trail. She was arrested, extradited to England, and stood trial for her heinous crime. Kate Webster's crime, due to its brutality and the audacity with which she tried to cover it up, would become a notorious case of the Victorian era. And um, what if her fate, you might wonder, what was Kate's fate? Kate Webster, after being found guilty of the murder of Julia Martha Thomas, was sentenced to death. She was hanged on July 29, 1879 at Wandsworth Prison in London. Her execution was carried out by the famous executioner William Marwood, who used the long drop method to ensure a quicker and more humane death. Before her execution, she reportedly confessed to the crime. The Servant Girl Annihilator moniker was given to the still unidentified serial killer who was active in Austin, Texas, between 1884 and 1885. The killer is credited with a series of gruesome murders that caused panic and fear in the community during that time. 
and killer targeted young women, especially and initially those who were servants. In total, eight people were killed and several others were seriously injured. The killer was particularly dreadful in his methods. Wielding knives, axes, bricks, and even iron rods, he decimated his mostly female victims with inhuman rage and disregard. The inequitable treatment of his victims by police and society overall would be emphasized on a December night in Austin. December 24, 1885 was meant to be a joyous occasion as families and friends gathered to celebrate Christmas Eve. But for 17-year-old Eula Phillips, it would be her last night alive. Eula, a young and beautiful woman, was part of Austin's high society. She was married to James Phillips, a well-to-do young man, and together they had a young son. While her age and circumstances may have present day seem atypical, but in the late 19th century, it was not uncommon for individuals to marry and start families at a younger age than what is typical in many modern Western societies. The average age of marriage for women in the US during the late 1800s was in the early 20s, but it was not unusual for women to marry in their late teens, especially in more rural areas or among working class families. Their life was, by all accounts, typical of the city's elite, or better off. On that fateful night, as the city was wrapped in festive cheer, a sinister shadow lurked in the darkness. Eula and James returned home from a Christmas party, unaware that they were being watched. As they settled into bed, a noise outside startled them. James went to investigate, only to be brutally attacked. He was knocked unconscious but survived. The assailant then turned his attention to Eula. She was brutally murdered in her bed with the same gruesome modus operandi that had become the signature of the servant girl Annihilator. Her body was discovered outside her house, having been dragged out by the killer. The scene was one of utter horror with Eula's lifeless body bearing the marks of a violent struggle. The community was in shock. While previous victims had been servant girls, Eula was from a prominent family. The brutality of her murder, combined with her social status, sent shockwaves through Austin society. The city was paralyzed with fear as the realization set in that no one was safe from this ruthless killer. The investigation to Eula's murder was intense. Several suspects were brought in for questioning, including her husband, James, due to some rumors of marital discord. However, he was eventually cleared of any involvement. As with the other murders, the trail went cold and justice remained elusive. Eula's murder highlighted the societal divisions of the time. While the earlier killings of black servant girls had caused concern, it was the murder of a white woman from a prestigious family that truly galvanized the community. The press coverage was extensive and the pressure on law enforcement became immense. But as the weeks turned into months and then years, the identity of the killer remained a mystery. Eula's tragic death like the other victims of the servant girl annihilator, became a chilling reminder of the dark underbelly of a city on the rise. The victims were of different racial backgrounds, including black and white women. This was unusual for serial killings of the time, as they typically targeted individuals of a single race. The killer's methods were particularly horrifying. The victims were attacked while they slept in their beds. Many of the victims were severely mutilated, and some had sharp objects inserted into their ears. The killer also posed a threat to men. Several male victims were killed while attempting to protect or aid the women being attacked. The Austin Police Department was baffled by the crimes. The methods and brutality of the attacks were unlike anything they had seen before. Numerous suspects were arrested, but none were convicted of the crimes. The killings then stopped, as suddenly as the carnage began it ceased, and the identity of the killer was cast to the fog of time, a mystery to this day. The killings had a profound effect on the city of Austin. People lived in fear, and many took precautions like boarding up windows and sleeping with weapons. The case received widespread media attention, with newspapers from as far away as New York covering the story. It also serves as a reminder of the cost of inequitable treatment of victims and the harm that comes with societal class systems. There have been many theories about the identity and motives of the killer. Some believe that the servant girl Annihilator may have been the early work of the infamous Jack the Ripper, though there's no concrete evidence to support this. 
Other theories suggest that the killer may have been a local man familiar with the area and its residents. The Servant Girl Annihilator case is considered one of the earliest instances of a serial killer in the United States. The unsolved nature of the case has made it a subject of interest for true crime enthusiasts and historians. It's also worth noting that, while as I said the killer remains unknown, some argue that the Servant Girl Annihilator could have been a man by the name of Nathan Elgin. In February of 1866, just weeks after the murder of Eula Phillips, Elgin abducted a girl from a saloon in Austin. He took her to a nearby house where her cries for help were heard by neighbors. Police responding shot and killed Elgin. What links Elgin to the feared servant girl Annihilator is actually his feet. He has only four toes on his left foot. A trait and feature that interestingly matches bare footprints found at Annihilator crime scenes. However, there was no definitive evidence linking him to all the crimes, and his involvement remains a topic of debate among historians and true crime enthusiasts. It's also worth noting that while the missing toe was a significant piece of evidence, it wasn't conclusive proof of Elgin's guilt. The case remains unsolved, and the true identity of the servant girl annihilator is still unknown. The streets of Lambeth in the 1890s were bustling with life, but an undercurrent of fear began to grip the area. Prostitutes and locals whispered about friends who had mysteriously fallen ill and died after being with a certain client, a seemingly respectable doctor. Born in 1850 in Glasgow, Scotland, but raised in Canada, Dr. Thomas Neil Cream pursued medical studies and became a licensed physician. His medical knowledge would later play a sinister role in his criminal activities. Dr. Cream's first known crime was in 1879 in Canada when he was connected to the death of a woman due to a botched abortion. He was also suspected of poisoning patients and acquaintances using Strike 9, a powerful toxin. So you moving to Chicago, he continued his murderous spree. He was eventually convicted for one of these murders and imprisoned in 1881. Surprisingly, he was released in 1891 for good behavior. Relocating to London, he resumed his pattern of poisoning, targeting prostitutes in the Lambeth area, which earned him the nickname the Lambeth Poisoner. Dr. Thomas Neil Cream, with his medical bag in hand, would frequent the dimly lit alleys of Lambeth. To many, he appeared as a gentleman, often offering to help women with medical issues. However, his treatments were far from healing. One evening, a local woman named Tilda Clover complained of feeling unwell. Dr. Cream offered her a remedy, a small pill he claimed would alleviate her symptoms. Trusting the doctor, Matilda took the pill, not knowing the deadly poison it contained. By morning, she was dead. As more women met the same fate, suspicion began to grow. Whispers about the Lambeth poisoner circulated, with many suspecting the involvement of a medical professional due to the nature of the deaths. Dr. Cream, however, grew bolder. He sent letters to the police, taunting them about their inability to catch him. He even tried to frame fellow doctors, hoping to divert attention, but his hubris was his undoing. One evening, in a local tavern, an inebriated Dr. Cream boasted about his knowledge of the latest poisoning. An undercover officer present at the scene took note the subsequent investigation unraveled Dr. Cream's web of deceit and murder. The community was both relieved and horrified to discover that the man behind the poisonings was a trusted medical professional. The trial was a sensation with newspapers detailing every revelation. The final verdict was clear. Dr. Thomas Neil Cream was a murderer. Found guilty, he was hanged on November 15, 1892 in Newgate Prison. As he met his end at the gallows, many reflected on the dual nature of the man, a healer by day and a killer by night. Dr. Cream's story remains a chilling reminder of the potential darkness that can reside within individuals, even those in positions of trust and authority. As we conclude our journey through the dark alleyways of the Victorian era, it's essential to remember that while these grim tales offer a glimpse into a bygone era's shadows, they also serve as a reminder of humanity's duality, that the most dreadful lessons learned are never forgotten. Until next time, please stay dreadfully curious.